the history and evolution of MOOCs. The term Massive Open Online Courses, MOOCs, first introduced in 2008 by Dave Cormier to describe Siemens and Downs Connectivism and Connective Knowledge course. The online course was initially designed for a group of 25 enrolled, fee-paying students to study for credit and at the same time was open to registered-only learners worldwide. As a result, over 2,300 people participated in the course without paying fees or gaining credit. This is a timeline representing MOOC models and early providers. In 2011, Sebastian Thrun and his colleagues at Stanford opened access to the course they were teaching at the university. Introduction to Artificial Intelligence attracted 160,000 learners in more than 190 countries. The origin and aim of the MOOC model is to open up education and provide free access to university-level education for as many students as possible. Some MOOCs are massive but not open, and some are open but not massive. The development of MOOCs is rooted within the ideas of openness and education. That knowledge should be freely shared, and the desire to learn should be met without demographic, economic, and geographical constraints. This is a MOOC and open education timeline showing the influence of open educational resources. A key message that emerges is that the evolution of MOOCs is leading to more players in the market as higher education institutions and private organizations seek to take advantage of these innovations in online learning. At first, tremendous attrition rates were reported as the results of first offerings via MIT and Coursera. MIT's course 6.002x, Circuits and Electronics, um, of these participants, 155 learners, there were 23,000 that tried the first problem set, 9,000 passed the midterm, 7,157 passed the course as a whole, 340 students, including a 15-year-old Mongolian, got a perfect score on the final. Even under criticisms of this model in e-learning, MOOCs are being widely used and showing success. My topic is actually being experienced by me. According to the Science and Practice of Yoga MOOC currently being offered on the edX platform, uh, we have more than 17,000 participants at this time enrolled. This MOOC is being touted as one of the largest global yoga learning experiences ever conducted. The learner profile determines and addresses learner preferences early on. Here are some revealing outcomes of Discout's inaugural study on humans and their tech, which found people spend roughly two to four hours per day on a mobile device tapping. Is this healthy? The science and practice of Yoga MOOC is intended to add to the research base surrounding yoga. Attendings, uh, attendees are asked for voluntary participation in several research activities throughout the course. Expectations are clearly stated, relevant, and achievable. Promotion and marketing of the event depends heavily on social media platforms before, during, and after the course. Students are expected to develop professional learning communities that will last a lifetime. The objective and instructors are clearly noted. Plus, this MOOC offers a verified certificate for those who are serious about completion of the course. Notes about the course help learners understand theoretical themes and overall vision of the learning experience.
Professor George Siemens says it's like teaching and learning and living, knowledge is also networked. And the walls of research need the same thinning that is happening to many classrooms. Learning to think in networks is critical, and it takes time, especially for established academics and administrators. As for the future of the MOOC model, Macaulay, Stewart, Siemens, and Cormier tell us it is so new that it has been subjected to little research. They say MOOCs will enable someone with even the most esoteric interest with the overall focus of the MOOC to find people with whom to share and collaborate. It means also that the specific expertise of the facilitator can reach the maximum possible number of people interested in accessing that expertise. Macaulay, Stewart, Siemens, and Cormier tell us the heterogeneity of the student body with its wide range of knowledge and skills means that the facilitator will not have to commit to the impossible task of responding individually to each student's needs. Issues and challenges include, one, the extent to which it can support deep inquiry and the creation of sophisticated knowledge. Two, the breadth versus the depth of participation. Three, whether, the, uh, whether and under what conditions successful participation can extend beyond those with broadband access and sophisticated social network, like networking skills. Four, identifying the processes and practices that might encourage lurkers or legitimate peripheral uh, participants to take on more active and central roles. Five, the impact or value of even peripheral participation, uh, specifically extent to um, which it might contribute to the participation in the digital economy in extra moot practices. Number six, specific strategies to maximize the effective contribution of facilitators in particular. And number seven, more advanced participants in general role for accreditation, if any, and how it might be implemented. And finally, more research is needed to define the viability of MOOCs from an economic perspective. It's also considered a challenge. <laughs>